It's going to take a lot to drag me away from you. This is PodKit, episode 26, Doubted the Right Side, on Saturday, October 29, 2016. And now, it's the proness that makes the pro pro. This episode of PodKit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad, with show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk26. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi, gang. How's it going? It's going pretty well. It's good. It's been a another month or two yeah it's like halloween and it's uh 40 out actually it's 50 right now but pretty close close enough it was almost 70 yesterday i know super nice yesterday oh my goodness yeah strange for october uh what day was it yesterday 28 yeah Yeah. but along with it along with this brisk fall weather what else comes along i don't know apple events perhaps apple events yes Yes. this is true we finally uh, heard uh, announced what we've been waiting for some time. I believe since the inception of PodKit, uh, an update to the Retina MacBook Pro. Um, yes. Now just called MacBook Pros. Um, we talked uh, at length about this. Brian and I did on uh, the, mo- the recent Nexus special. Uh, I believe that's Nexus special number forty-nine. Um, yes. But simultaneously, uh, we can talk a little bit about that here. Um, really the most desirable one, I think, for, for myself and for, for many of us is the 15-inch MacBook Pro uh, i7. Uh, personally, I'd probably configure it with 16 gigs of RAM and a 512 gigabyte uh, solid-state drive, so it's a little bit above uh, stock. Um, yeah, but... I think I'd, I'd probably be in the same boat as you. I'm going to see. I haven't actually gone through and like configured for fun what Mac I would like, but I'm going I'm to do that now, and I'll, and I'll report to you. But I think... Awesome. Yeah, this having the these MacBook Pros updated, like the 15-inch MacBook Pro, like drives so much the, of the code that is written in the U.S. I think <laughs> and around the world. Like, I, I love the amongst, impression of that. Amongst hold on, here's here's amongst you know startups and more of the quote hip com- hip companies uh, that don't have uh, exclusive Microsoft contracts and right you know, things like that. Well. I, I was um, not on the um, Nexus special, but I will share some of my thoughts. Um, we we actually at work, um, you know, took took like a good half an hour to watch the part about the Max, and um, you know, uh, most the reception that I got in the room. So like, some of us are iOS people, some of us are Android people, some of us are Windows people, some of us are Mac people, and um, you know, the impression I get in the room is that yeah, the Touch Bars cool but um like what is that going to help us do while we're working at work probably nothing none of us are really you know people using editing tools and hey there's xcode support the we don't do xcode so that won't matter friends could support at some point maybe yeah maybe yeah. but it's it's sort of isn't JetBrains Java? Like, how is that going to work out? Yeah, but they have layers for mm, suspicious MOS. So, like, but, it, yeah, I don't know. Like, we'll the see. value of it is sort of questionable in certain l- lines of work. I mean, I guess if you have a MacBook Pro, you're not going to be a writer typing on it all day long. You're going to be an engineer of some sort doing some kind of engineering like task. Um, you, may, you may, I actually, a good number of uh, copywriters I know, uh, like, my workplace is almost entirely uh, full of MacBook Pros, and that's an intentional decision by our IT folks. Um, in the ad world in particular, the Retina MacBook Pro is uh, the kind of the tool of choice for everyone kind of regardless of department. Yeah, that's because your business makes sense. <laughs> um, so the one I like, of course, is the 15-inch i7 quad-core. Mm, quad-cores. So I, I would Wonderful. say um, I'm, I've spec'd out mine here. I'd probably buy the the Space Gray 15-inch with the, the the higher up model of the baseline configuration, the, the twenty seven hundred base. Mm-hmm. Yep. Then I would bump the CPU to two point nine gigahertz quad core, so adding two hundred dollars to that. Yep. Let's get some more turbo boost, some more megahertz, maybe some more L three cache. I'm not sure what yep. the technical differences are, but I figure why not? It's two hundred dollars. I did it for this one, and it's still running. I'd probably stick to five twelve, just because. A terabyte would be nice, but that's four hundred dollars, and I can just back up and. Well, and of other course, stuff. because you have four Thunderbolts on that product, I mean, yeah. there will be Thunderbolt enclosures, or maybe just even direct connections to solid states in the future. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 
Um, and so I think 512 is fine. And then I would probably upgrade the GPU to a 460 from a 455 because it's just yep. $100 and I'm doubling oh, the video RAM. That's not actually that bad. I didn't know that. Yeah. Like the just $100, like I think it's So what, what's it. the total price of that configuration? Uh, $3,099, which oh, is, that's yep. actually really which good. Which is pretty much the same price I bought my 2012 MacBook Pro here yep. for. And it has basically the same specs, 16 gigs of RAM, uh, 512 gig um, SSD, and the, well, it has, it has the NVIDIA 650M, so... But with only, I think it's only one gigabyte of video RAM, maybe yep. one and a half. But I think I might even share it with main memory. I'm not sure. So Brian, that is the exact configuration that I generated when I went through the final time. Okay. <laughs> yep. Good to know we think alike. Same boat, same boat. Now I think um, one more thing. I don't know if we talked about it. Oh, what, what was I going to say? Even crap. Oh yeah, the the RAM. So it it, it maxes at 16 gigs. It's a, think... it's sort of a shame, I think. That is, I heard, because the low-power DDR3 maxes out at 16 gigabytes. Why are they so, using DDR3 still? Because uh, it's lower power. I think the, I don't know if there's low-power DDR4 yet or something. There is? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm not sure the details. Maybe it was cheaper, it was lower energy than mm. even low-power DDR4. Suspicious. I'm sure there's some reason. My hope, and me and Brandon talked about this on mm-hmm. the next special, that with the KB Lake CPUs, they'll move to DDR4 and introduce 32 gigabytes. Yeah, that was another thing that I was sort of sad about. Like, I had, I had hoped that because other vendors were coming out with Kaby Lake products already in the i7 variety, no less, that Apple II would have also done that. Well, the thing is, I think Apple's the first pe- the first manufacturer to sell some of these Skylake chips at this power level because the low end MacBook Pro 13 inch has a 15 watt CPU. The high-end 13-inch MacBook Pro has a 28-watt CPU, and the 15-inch has a 45-watt CPU. So these are three power levels. I'm not sure I'd have how to look many at of the these SKUs. were released. I'd have to look at the SKUs to know for sure, but um, there have been laptops already with Skylake 6700 HQ processors, for example. Yeah. And you know, as far as Intel would tell you, that that's the highest it goes. Yeah. I think... It's also interesting that they released the 13-inch MacBook Pro at the lower end because it's the same power level as a MacBook Air, I mm-hmm. think. Does MacBook Air, is that a 15-watt I chip? don't know. Might, might be an 8. or No, I think it's in the teens, seven. yeah. Okay. So that's just a comparison. Other than the 11 must have been lighter. Yeah, that's that, that's what makes the... Um... Because the 12-inch MacBook is 4.5 watt. Right. Which is a lot lighter. So just some more comparisons there, I guess. So I'll totally get one, but I need to wait for reviews first. Um, oh, you think you're going to get one of these? Yeah, definitely. What what configuration would you do? The one you just said. Okay. Um, <laughs> yep, that's the one. Yeah, that's that the one. That's the would one. this replace your, your new Windows computer? Yeah, absolutely. Laptop? Yeah. Um, so I'm waiting really for two things. Reviews, of course, just in general, you know, like, you know, if the screens are flaky or something or the yeah. keyboard is just atrocious, like, you know, maybe I'll can reconsider. But the other reason I want to wait is I want to see if work decides to buy them for work. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so at, at work, you know, we have these, um, Ivy bridge that's I three, uh, you know, third generation. Yeah, right. So they're getting a little old. So they're, they're getting uh, just a little old, but really old. I threes. I mean, I sevens in that generation. Those are the power hungry ones. Yes. I mean, I have an Ivy Bridge in my MacBook Pro, and it's right. four years old. And so. and and what's worse is they didn't buy the quad core model; they bought the dual, dual core oh, no. Ivy Bridges, and they're just oh, not goodness. they're not fast for modern development tasks. To make it even worse, they don't have solid state drives. Oh no! And and so I I you guys need upgrades. They do have been saving for four years to buy Mac Pros, right? Right, exactly. And so we, of, co- of course they do have 16 gigs of memory, which is their only saving factor. But yeah. but really, that is just everything CPU bound. Then well, seems to be the trick, well, it's either right? C- either CPU bound or disk bound. So right. you, you 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 can't win on either side. Yeah. yeah. Do you um, think is there a good uh, push for using Apple computers there? Or? Um. So um. The the line of service lead is a Mac guy. Okay, like nice. his entire family yeah. uses iPhones and Macs. So I suspect if he are gets you, his way, and are you he pushing, would push. Oh, I I, I I I push every time that comes up. Good. Um, like I don't necessarily even care if it's a Mac. To be honest, I don't. Like I can use any computer. I can put a virtual box on. Yeah. Um, but it needs to have an i7. It needs to have a solid state drive. It needs to have a quad core i7. And I think a MacBook Pro is built a it, lot better than a lot of other... It, it should have a, an okay screen. I really don't care because I'm going to use external monitors. But, like, the factors, it should be fast and useful. Yeah. 
um, you know, I'll use it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I ordered the the 13 inch MacBook Pro for my dad, who's back in um, school right now. Touch barless. Nope, with Touch Bar. Okay. I uh, I asked him saying, "Hey, do you want which one? Do you want?" I was thinking he would go for the, just the cheaper one, but mm-hmm. he said, "No, Touch Bar sounds cool." I'm like, "Good." And then like further reading on Twitter after I ordered that, I'm like, "Okay, this the Touch Bar one is actually a lot better." Yeah. You know, it has four Thunderbolt three ports. However, Brennan was was linking to me earlier. That the controller for the right hand side is, I guess, lower speed. I'm not quite mm-hmm. sure why, but yeah, I think uh, on the Nexus special or perhaps a couple of other times we've I, we've talked about how I've uh, perhaps been a little bit of like a uh, uh, you've doubted the right side. Yeah, I, I've I've, <laughs> uh, I, I've been a, I've been a right hand side port truther, one might say. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what? Essentially, what what this kind of comes from is there's a laptop that I use for some uh, live event production for JavaScript Minnesota, and for yep. some reason the right hand side port is uh, USB port and HDMI port are both just like useless. Really? They hmm. super super flaky, unbelievably hmm. flaky. And uh, we hypothesize the reason is that these ports are not actually part of the logic board. Interesting. Right? So they're like on a separate board that's somehow connected, you know, in the same way that like when you build a PC, there's that the front panel ports are on a different, are, are not part of the logic board uh, like the back ports are, right? Like the, the rear case ports are. Um, and it seems like that's probably the same situation they're running into with the 13-inch uh, Pro. Um, it's kind of the same sort of deal that you have like if you want to use like a PCI expansion slot for your, um, well, if... I mean, it's hilarious that I that I reference that because in a lot of ways Thunderbolt is like a PCI bus uh, with with a connector, yeah, uh, with a USB Type C connector in this case. Um, but it, essentially, it seems like what 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 they needed to do is they needed to create a separate non logic board uh, like uh, board circuit board to handle those right hand side ports, and right. it just must not be up to snuff in order to keep it keep it in place. Uh, I hypothesized on Twitter too that maybe the reason why there's a different card handling those those ports on the 13 inch and the 15 inch is that the 15 inch has a little bit more space mm-hmm. for uh, for kind of the um, a, a different kind of expansion card to be put in there. Who knows? Based on the X-rays, it looks like it might even just be part of the of the core like logic board all the way through. Yeah, but I could it, be wrong it could that. be just even the the chipset in the in the 15 inch yeah. is different. And maybe it yep. just has more, more, more power for that because those are the quad cores I th- anyway. I, b- I would assume a Thunderbolt chip is a little power hungry, so I wouldn't yeah. be surprised yeah. if it was a power thing. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm curious how slow they are. I mean, if it's 20 gigabit, that's still Thunderbolt two speed, so that's probably not too bad. I mean, I, as, yeah, as long right. as they can... it says they can both drive at least 10 gigabit USB right. three. As long as they can at least drive a display on each side. I don't think you're awesome. I mean, yeah. I think it's going to be fine. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. Like, and and when I say drive a display on each side, I mean, it just a 1080p panel, nothing fancy. And, you know, just, you know, at least 30 frames per second, I guess. But, you know, hopefully 60. Yeah. Again, nothing fancy. Yeah. So back to the computer I was buying or my, my dad ordered that I ordered for him. So it's just the baseline 13 inch with touch touch bar. So it's, you know, 2.9 gigahertz, the dual core i5 hyper threads, I think to four, um, I, you know, considered a little bit upgrading to an i7, but it's still a dual core, so I don't know if it was really worth the difference. Um, you know, he, I got him 8 gigs of RAM. I didn't quite think he'd ever need 16. I think 8 is still pretty good for today, maybe? Yeah. Oh, so, for sure. So my computer that I just bought, the little Windows one, it has 8 gigs of memory, and the memory constraint isn't the constraint. It's the, it's really just it's i7 dual core. Yeah. Yep. So having a solid-state drive, almost cuts your ram capacity like it it cuts the need for ram capacity drastically yeah because any swap isn't as noticeable yep yep and so you know he has the 256 gig pcie Mm -hmm. it's crazy and you know intel uh iris 550 graphics which is good enough um well it's better than 540 it's better you know it's not the lowest end so that's good so and i think he likes the touch bar so oh and shipping is now four to five weeks interesting oh there's two to three weeks before I think I got it in two or three weeks, so it should arrive at the latest by November 23rd. So I'll hope to play around with it and at least inspect it a little bit, help him set it up. So mm-hmm. I'll, I'll report back probably next episode how it, how it goes. Perfect. Yep. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, you know, hopefully that 
is good. And another thing, they don't sell the uh, hard disk plattered based uh, Super Drive non retina display MacBook Pro anymore. Good. They now Yay. sell a thirteen hundred dollar um, one or two point seven gigahertz i five dual core one twenty eight gig SSD, eight gigs of RAM MacBook Pro. So this is. And it has Intel Iris Graphics 6100, so this sounds like it's still a Haswell era CPU. That's too bad. Oh my goodness, Maybe. that's awful. And two Thunderbolt 2 ports. So it's just, it's just you know, the baseline previous generation MacBook Pro 13-inch. Yeah. And that's, I bet you that's, you know, for their education, a little cheaper. It still has a retina display, so it's it's something. I'm curious how much how for upgradeability education, huh? it is. That, see, that's so weird. And because... that's still more expensive. You know, I think MacBook Air is probably pretty... Popular because it I was think, cheaper. I think the, I think the MacBook Air almost is better for education at this point because right. you can you can get a higher capacity MacBook Air for cheaper than that MacBook Pro, and it would almost just be as fast. Um, what do you mean higher capacity in terms of storage? storage? Yeah. So well, this you can update. You can upgrade to two fifty six, five twelve, and one terabyte. Yeah, but what if you're in if you're in, if you're in education, you might not do custom orders. True. Right. So you can buy and off this the one shelf. can get sixteen gigs, and you can upgrade the CPU. To a two point uh, nine gigahertz dual core i five and a three point one gigahertz dual core i seven. So yeah. you can do some updates, but it's still not quite. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what what did you think about just the the fact that they made the the lowest end MacBook Pro a MacBook Pro and not just like oh just another MacBook? I think they should have called that one MacBook. They should have gotten Maybe rid of the MacBook, MacBook Plus. Air. No, don't introduce another name. Hey. I think they should have released. I think they should have um, completely revamped the whole MacBook line. So maybe updated the old 12-inch MacBook. And I think they should have just done MacBook, MacBook Pro. It it really differentiates. I I really like their the old school. You know, in the early 2000s, Apple had that the graph for yeah, consumer, the professional, mobile, and desktop, where they yep. had mm-hmm. the iMac and the Power Mac and the iBook and the Power. I, I totally feel like there's room for three parts of a line. Um, I don't. I don't. I mean, clearly the iPad has shown that's true. So there's the mini, there's the regular, and there's the pro. That's true, but there's also a regular size pro. So it's right. So, yeah. but I mean, it's the pro ness that makes the pro pro. Yeah, I think. Yeah, because right now I'm looking at the Apple.com slash Mac slash compare. You know, there's the there's MacBook 12 inch starting at 1300. There's the MacBook Air 13 inch starting at 1000. MacBook Pro 13 inch starting at 1200, which is that old model. Uh, MacBook Pro 15 inch. They're still selling this. I guess they're still selling the old gen MacBook Pro 15 inch as well for 2000. Then they also have, maybe they are, I don't know. It's on this compare page at least. Then they have MacBook Pro 13 inch, which has no touch bar. Then they have MacBook Pro 13 inch with touch bar. Uh, then they have MacBook Pro 15 inch with touch bar. And then, you know, their iMacs and things. But. It's just there's a lot of models to compare with, and I think it's going to be difficult to choose what people want. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 I just think I just think the hard. MacBook Air 13 inch is an awkward computer because it's not Retina. Oh well, right, and sure, it's, totally. It's but it's cheaper. Yes, it's cheaper, and that's what that's the only thing it has going for it. And yeah. I guess it's uh, it's less powerful as well. It, um, you know, the baseline is a 1.6 gigahertz dual core i5, so it's a little lower clocked. But I don't know, and it doesn't have force touch trackpad either, where every other one does. So it, it is lower on features. Yeah. So I guess it is kind of like the cheap MacBook, and that's why it's right. And it's, it's weird there. that they didn't update them. Yeah, I think this will eventually be phased out, and that's just you know their holdout for here's a cheap computer. You suckers don't want to spend more, so buy this instead. Or, or maybe maybe one day the 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 price of Retina will come down enough. To make the you know MacBook One cheap enough to be a thousand dollars, yeah, I I I hope that eventually because I think it it's you know that thirteen hundred mark so it's more expensive but really under you know lighter powered yeah, exactly and so they're trying to appeal to people who want a really lightweight portable computer that are willing to pay a little more for it right and I think it could benefit from being in a thousand dollar price point right and, and that's then what maybe I'm releasing saying. a more powerful MacBook or a or a between MacBook, MacBook Plus, yeah, like that where the MacBook Air is now. That yeah. is maybe a little more powerful, maybe a little more, but still cheaper than a Pro and more expensive than right. a MacBook. I think that would be good. Yeah, and I think they could call that a MacBook Plus. I don't know. It, it's, these screen sizes start to 
And, and I just like the if they days called it a MacBook Plus, was... though, everybody's acronym, everybody's abbreviation for MacBook Pro would die. Can't do that. <laughs> yeah. There's no way to win. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm just curious what it's going to be in the future. I just I just have fond memories of when it was this more simple time when you yeah. had MacBook and MacBook Pro. Yep. And you knew Pro was 15 inch or 17 inch. MacBook was always 13 inch. And that was that was it. It was pretty simple. And you could upgrade the MacBook to a certain extent, and then you'd go for Pro. And basically, making a 13-inch MacBook Pro kind of threw it all around because you know then everyone everyone got the 13-inch MacBook Pro. I think the, you know the Air when the Air was updated, it became more popular as well. But right, ugh, okay, MacBooks. That was a that, that was, was a fun. Good, that was a good topic. Yeah. So what, next up, Brian, you got to tell us about Weatherbot. Yeah, so I've been working on Weatherbot version 2.0, which is kind of my third rewrite. Their third larger writing of it i've been working on it for the last couple weeks or a month really basically adding more um object oriented designs so i basically have a models.py file i have a link to my github here if you're interested in following along while i speak so uh, i have a models.py which has um a couple name tuples just for storing some data as well as some errors but basically i made a weather location uh class which is more or less just a fancy dictionary with some pair methods, which doesn't really need to exist, but I think it's easier and it's it's a it's a it's a data type that will only be stored for weather location. So why not make it a class weather alert, which basically um, wraps around the Python library I use for weather alerts and adds some extra features like a an easy SHA method to to get a unique ID, um, see if the weather alert is expired, and a nice um, string method, and then my weather data replaces an old big mess of a dictionary with some more um, fields that I can access as well as um, a feature I have yet to fully implement seeing if there's precipitation in the in the hour so I can um, uh, hopefully be able to put out a little alert saying it's gonna re- there's gonna be precipitation within the next hour starting here and, and then you know if it's if it's been running all day I could say all right it's, uh, it's gonna stop soon and then a weatherbot string which is a new feature where there's a strings.yml file where you can specify a bunch of, of text in whether, whatever language you would like. You can specify the language on the top, which will pull in the right um, language from the weather provider for using its summaries. And so then you can build build random strings for tweets. And that was kind of the, the main reason for this rewrite, which was I started on after talking to Ryan a while ago, who said, you were going to work on it, but then you didn't. So then I said, I'll do it. <laughs> And that's where I'm here. And I've just done some little bit of refactoring within the within the code as well, and um, writing a lot more doc strings so it's more readable because I know it's kind of a mess. I think I'm at the point where I have some methods where the doc strings are longer than the code, but it's all right. No worries. No, it's understandable. It's understandable. It's really cool to see how it's developed over time too. Uh, certainly now. So I see that you're using the Dark Sky API, right? Yeah. Is that that used to be forecast.io. It yes, still is. They they had a they went through a name change maybe a month ago or oh, in okay. September. I just got an email in my inbox saying we're renaming to Dark Sky API instead of forecast.io. And so I'm like, all right. So I think the website still exists though, right? Uh forecast.io redirects. However, oh, okay. the api.forecast.io yeah. still returns stuff. Okay, good. It's just deprecated. So I I went to the weather library and I just there's a manual URL feature so I started making calls to api.darksky.net. The library has since been updated to do that, but I nice. I do manual so I can add in some things like language and things. It's not necessarily built into the wrapper. I should really cool. make my own wrapper at this point because <laughs> I basically uh, am subclassing every class there or using its class as the input to the class that I made, but yep. maybe that'll be later. I don't know. But I'm adding better test coverage. Um, I renamed some some environmental variables and whatnot. I don't, my readme there is still for the previous version. So I don't have any real user documentation yet, but my, the main thing I want to talk about is how would you implement a precipitation alert? So the dark sky app, as well as carrot weather, which also uses dark sky API has support for precipitation notifications. So this is only if you're in the U S or the UK and very small parts of Canada, where there's a minutely field in the dark sky API so they have, for every minute in the hour, it'll say the precipitation type and then the intensity and probability and error rate of precipitation at that minute. 
So you can make a fancy graph of here's, you know, it's going to rain a lot more in a few minutes and it's going to stop and maybe start up again. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to make a feature that will kind of replicate their existing notifications in those apps, but instead on um, the, the Twitter bot. So I'm, I currently am, I think, going to check if, if there's precipitation forecasted for the hour. So there's an icon field. So if you're in a weather app, like on your phone or something, it'll show you know, a cloud with rain or a sun or something. So if, it, right if it's set to rain or, or snow or something like that, then I'll say, okay, there's precipitation in the hour. Now, that's, that's as far as I've gotten, and I need to do some way of, of tracking uh, th- what the current is you know, to, to make sure I'm only going to alert when, it's, when it hasn't rained yet, and then it's going to, to be raining. It'll, it'll manage that. And I just implemented a, a, a cache, so it'll cache to disk every time it runs. If, if, it's, if it's a little cache within there is changed, it'll write to disk. So if this thing does crash, I can kind of start back from baseline. But Right on. All, all these sound like really, uh, like really insightful changes. <laughs> Way cool. So I need to deal with the precipitation thing, and I'm not quite sure how I'll do that. But maybe I'll, maybe I'll skip it. But hopefully not. I need. Hopefully I'll find <laughs> inspiration one, one of these evenings. Maybe tonight. I don't know. I haven't worked on it right. in a few days. So. Right on. No worries. Well, cool to see what happens. Yeah, that's 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 what I've been doing in my in my one project. I I do and. Fun fact, another fork has happened within the last month or so. Some other random oh, really? person has forked. So uh, there are two forks, but no one who has forked it has contributed code. Aww. At least, at least last I checked. I have seen no pull requests. Is there a way to see who forked it? If you go to, if you click on graphs and then there's members, you can oh. see who forked it. Cool. So I have a friend who goes on GitHub by Degusas. He helped mm-hmm. with, it was really me and him, but he helped with a couple strings That's cool. back last winter, but... Yeah, so one one of these polls is even with master, and one is eighteen commits behind master. So they forked. I don't know if they're in use. I have not checked. I have no way to check. But hey, but I do think this bot is the most featured Twitter bot of its type written in Python. <laughs> well, there you go. Pretty, nice. pretty narrow spec, but hey, if that's what it takes. Yeah. I Should I put that in a readme? Probably the most yes, popular. Yes, I think that's a great table. Yeah. <laughs> You sh- I, I'm, I'm a firm believer of writing readme's like I write my Twitter bios, right? <laughs> yeah, because Cur- oh, currently my, my little sub line is a Twitter bot for weather powered by Dark Sky. Nice. And then I have, note, any language or wording suggestions are appreciated. So once this I do merge, it's just a strings.yml file. So if anyone would ever like to contribute, you just add a new line, and it's very very simple. You don't have to touch any code. So it'll, That's awesome. And you can contribute to the default thing, and I'll always... Whatever sayings I'll use in my bots, I'll always put in on the GitHub. But I also I have it set so you can, um, you know, pass in or use your own file. In the configuration, you can set the file name to use. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty easy to have a bunch of files in a directory, and you can run a whole bunch of different bots that'll be for different languages or something like that. Way cool. Yeah, that's that's Weatherbot. Still still being developed after a year and a half. <laughs> nice. Now there's one more thing. I saw that I thought was kind of cool on on Twitter here just the last day or two. So yeah, no, you know, you know the Mac App Store, right? It you you update stuff with it and you install apps and system updates. But have you ha- have you had issues with that ever in the past? Uh, occasionally, occasionally, I know that there have been a couple of kind of high profile issues with the Mac App Store, right? Like with uh, the certificate kind of uh, expiration issue uh, where Apple kind of surreptitiously upgraded the uh, signing algorithm it was using for its certs, which required a cert reissue, which caused all the receipts to start failing. Yep. Yeah, uh, I that. yeah that, that's kind of the biggest issue that I have had with the Mac App Store, and that was really... Yeah. I've seen yeah. a lot of a lot of tweets over the years of in the updates tab where you, know, you click an update and it's n- you know not a number, so NAN of NAN because it's the Mac App Store is just a web a web wrapper, so mm-hmm. it's just bad JavaScript probably, and um, it just it's just I think the UI is pretty buggy, and it hasn't okay. gotten too much better, and so it just becomes a pain. You hit pause and doesn't pause. Hit cancel doesn't stop. So it's just kind of it doesn't respond and it it, it assumes things and it wants to do it yeah. in the background because it, it's really just a wrapper for some command line utilities under the hood. I bet. Mm-hmm. Anyway, someone wrote a command line command line utility called MAS, which stands for Mac App Store. So this is on GitHub 
uh, github.com slash mas dash cli slash mas this is also linked in the show notes so it's, i think it's it's um written in swift and objective c and it's just um a command line so you can do things like mas list it'll show um installed applications you can do search and you can install um an application if it's already been purchased from your account so it can't do the the purchasing there and you can do ma notably you can do mas outdated which will show apps that need that have updates and then you can do mas upgrade or upgrade just a specific application um you can also That's sign brilliant. into the mac app store via this utility um so i've i've and you can install it by doing just brew install mas mass and then you can maybe manage your mac app store updates via command line and then i should also note that there is the software update command line tool that has been on os 10 for a long time so you can do um, software update dash L, which will list updates and things like that. So you can install system updates via the command line as well. Nice, so if you're wanting yeah. to feel a little more in the command line era, if you do a lot with homebrew, maybe it'll be fun to do more system things there as well. Yeah, right on. So right on. Uh, one of the interesting things about um, like this, this is kind of one of a list of kind of weird Apple command line utilities that I didn't really think of what would really exist, but they did, right? Yeah. Um, I guess another one kind of in the series is like the disk utility one or the disk util. Oh, disk util uh, is great. Isn't, isn't that amazing, right? Oh, it's like one of my favorite, like best kept secrets there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, other other stuff like uh, uh, like the uh, launch control uh, yeah, I've, command line utilities. You like all that stuff. It. It's just like, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that Apple had an analog to this. It's just uh, like, it's just like it, on a Linux box, but it's Apple. Exactly. Yeah, I think exactly. I think the difference of of that is you know you don't do more system administration stuff on OS X with command line just because there's so many good GUI utilities for it, whereas mm-hmm. on Linux it's kind of you just assume it's command line by default. And yeah, definitely. I just and I don't run services in the same way. There's you know like if I want to install a little server utility, I you know I'll use iStat server as an example. So it comes with a thing. You'd say you need to install some services. You just type in your password and it's there. So under the hood, it might be doing that, but you never have to as a user. And yeah, definitely. I've I've only come across one or two c- conditions where I have had to do that, and that's with some homebrew homebrew thing like VN stat or something like that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, launch 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 D is is I think quite nice. I think that was added um, in Panther or Tiger, maybe even Panther. Leopard. Was I it think Panther? you're right. I think I, I'm gonna call it Panther until I look it up and find something else <laughs> yeah i'm i'm really i really wonder what it was like before that because it feels you know launch d is is i see it everywhere in process lists and no. just how the operating system works it's props to developers back then when they implemented that because i really. i'm a huge fan of like the way system d works i mm-hmm. at least with its um services um starting and stopping them and running them i i really like that i think it's quite powerful and I mm-hmm. think LaunchD is kind of the same. I just don't run things like that as often. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. could I could ship uh, Weatherbot with some systemd and LaunchD stuff. That'd be interesting. But I that would be awesome. I'll go on Docker instead. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. So or, uh, or should so... I use Docker with an OS ten image to run yes. Weatherbots? Yes, oh, that'd be amazing. So a real real time follow up. Uh, sys- uh, LaunchD was added to macOS and Tiger. You were right. Okay. Well, I listed three, so <laughs> one of those, yeah. No worries. Well, next up, I've got a bit of news. Uh, recently, we've had a lot of uh, – there's a lot of buzz in the community and uh, kind of in our local programming community about functional programming, uh, a couple of which are uh, uh, came up at the meetup that I helped organize, JavaScript Minnesota. Uh, last month, uh, so that would be September, we had a talk on rx.js, which is the – uh, kind of reactive programming library that underlies Angular 2, I believe. Yeah. Um, and this month uh, we had a talk on Elm, uh, which which is really interesting. And the Elm, the Elm one was uh, was uh, the Elm talk was given by a friend of mine, Mike Anderson, who I think I've mentioned a million and a half times in the Twitter followies thing because he's just that gosh darn awesome. Uh, and Elm is kind of the 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 thing that I probably perhaps have the most to say about because. It's such a neat language and such a departure from kind of um, – writing it feels like such a departure from writing C-based languages, which is cool. So Elm is, is kind of neat because it's derived from Haskell or it has a Haskell – the compiler – the Elm compiler is written in Haskell. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and the kind of the conventions of sorts that 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 are in place when you use Alm are really interesting because it's it's a total like like melting pot of um, kind of a, the the traditional like web app conventions that you might see in a Rails app or a Node.js app, um, but with this um, like syntax almost that seems to come from Haskell and um, the this type system that is uh, certainly a, 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 a more restrictive type uh, or a stronger type system, I guess, shall we say, than JavaScript, but it's still like really developer oriented. So it's not like Java where you're making like uh, abstract factory impulse factories, right? <laughs> oh, I think I think you just tried to uh, win me over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like the you know the it's definitely a strongly typed language, but it's that's mostly in ways where the Elm compiler tries to save you from yourself, and less so in the case where you're explicitly required to define everything. If right. That makes so sense. so they're using a uh, type inference here. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it's really nice. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, so uh, Mike's talk goes into uh, great detail as to um, how to build like an application using all of these uh, kind of paradigms that Elm uh, provides you. Uh, in addition to this like architecture that the community seems to have agreed upon for ways to build uh, rich web applications with Elm. So it's 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 a pretty neat talk. And if you're interested at all in that. Uh, take a look. I don't think I'll be doing anything with Elm and Prod right now, uh, or in the foreseeable future. But man, as it, as it matures, it's definitely going to be something to watch. Uh, the talk on uh, RxJS is really cool too, and it's definitely going to be uh, important for anyone interested in doing uh, Angular stuff in the future. Um, it also goes through a lot of kind of functional programming concepts that I think are really neat. Um, so if if you are in that React realm, or not React, uh, if you are in that Angular two realm. Uh, that would definitely be a thing that you might be interested in checking out. Yeah, I, I think I should mention also that from my what my understanding is that Elm helped inspire the React Redux model of, you know, taking a state of an application, uh, you know, changing its state but not modifying it, just, you know, yep. taking it, making a new one and putting it on the stack and then having that React down to the view layer. Absolutely, absolutely. That's that's one of the neatest things about Elm, I feel, too, is that it kind of was developed, it started uh, being developed kind of before React came to the forefront. Yep. Um, it's just but, nobody knew about it, and then, like, hey, look, here's the uh, JavaScript version of this. Yep, yep, exactly. Yeah. And that's, I, I think, uh, you're absolutely right. A lot of the things that make React and, and Redux and Redux sagas really fun to work with, I feel, are um, are uh, a lot of those things that I borrowed from Elm, which is just what makes Elm such a neat kind of environment to play around in right now. If you'd like to hear more of my ramblings about uh, Redux Saga, uh, you should definitely tune into this episode's Fringe because because it's there. <laughs> yeah, uh, the uh, syntax reminds me a lot of I don't know, like um, like it's an SML, like an a, a, an ML family language. Definitely, it's like OCaml or SML. It's really nice. I love it. Definitely. I have no intent to build anything with it though. Yeah, see, that's the trick. That's the trick. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was an interesting talk. I I like some parts of of Elm, but I, I, I like you. I don't think I'll be using it. I I, need, I think I should master all or many more features of JavaScript before I dive into the next next one. And I don't have a lot of functional experience, so I think it'd be a little more of a challenge for me in some places too. Yeah, the um the 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 change over between. Like so, this this is Haskell oriented. So like, SML is sort of yeah, you can you can do functional. That's pretty much what we want. But if you want to do you know regular imperative code, you can do that too, and it's fine. But I feel like Elm being Haskell oriented will restrict that much more. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Agreed. Yeah, I, I looked into Elm a while ago, and it, it's uh, I'm glad it's come a long way. So that's great. Um, so I have a cool thing to talk about also. Right on, go for it. So uh, one of the things I'm working on is auditing user actions. So let's say you have a web app. I know you're familiar with those. Oh, yes. And uh, let's say you want to know everything a user does. And the reason you need to know this is for legal reasons, for example. So um, you know, hypothetically, if you were 
you know, a doctor, you know, you might have an ex-wife and you might be spying on her medical records. Yeah. Uh, hypothetically. Well, how, how do we use the system to, to audit those actions and if, if necessary, present them in a, in a lawful, um, you know, verified way. And so we, we have these records, uh, in our system or where we need to get them out of the system and, and get them through, you know, the, the code that makes the system work, get that from there into a log and then to a thing that we can search upon. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's this sort of this tool chain from what users are doing sort of into a middle part where, you know, it's sort of in the system, but not like accessible by administrators or users either. And then accessible to administrators, maybe even the user originally, like if they want to see what they've done in the past. Yeah. So it's sort of this entire spread of work. And one of the things I'm working on is getting this to, to function well and scalably. And so in Java, and I, I expect it to exist in other languages, but I feel like it's probably greatly aided by the fact that Java is on that, on the, on the JVM and it can kind of just change itself on run at runtime however it wants Mm -hmm. is this idea of aspect oriented programming Mm -hmm. basically what you can do with an aspect is you can tell it well in this package or folder i have a bunch of controllers what i want you to do is run this code anytime a controller method is called okay that's it that's all you have to do you don't have to put like a line of code in each method. You don't have to that remember to do it for, for logging things. It, it's yeah. perfect. Right. Sure, yeah. and, and it really is quite fantastic. And, and so what you can do is you can have this aspect monitoring user activity and you can have it so that, you know, you can collect the username, the user ID. Uh, you can have it collect um, stuff like the, the IP address, the user agent. Um, you know, you can have it collect all of these you know, very useful identifying pieces of information of a user's session and their activity. You can, of course, have it record the, the the package they're in, the controller they're in, the method that they're in, the route that was used to execute that method. Mm-hmm. You can have all of this breadth of information, and it's super fantastic. But once you have it, what do you do with it? How do you get it from the middle to the end, where uh, either administrator or user can search it? Right? Where do you where do you yeah. put that? And so right. this is sort of the journey. So like. The programming part sort of ends there, and now we get to all of the super sort of newish web service thingies. So we go from the aspect, and we just pump it out into a file in JSON. So every line yeah. is a JSON line, mm-hmm. and it's, and it's and instead of doing a CSV file that's hard to parse and sort of sp- weird and we suspicious. You do more with JSON. It, really. it, it's, it's effortless. Everybody can use JSON. Like, yeah. mm-hmm. we're never going to forget how to parse it. It's it's here for life. Yeah. Um, so then we have a thing called FileBeat, and what FileBeat does is you start it up, you tell it where the logs are. It could either watch a directory or a file, and it can siphon the data from the logs and put it wherever you want. And so what we do is we siphon those logs into a thing called Logstash. Guess what Logstash is good at? Stashing logs? Stashing logs into Perfect. things. Well, so, I would have never guessed that. Yeah, it turns out. <laughs> it also has a mustache and it's a piece of wood. It's a weird... It, the mascot for Logstash is super weird. <laughs> I'm going to look it up here. Yeah. Yeah, right? Um, and, and so what Logstash can do, and it's really cool, is when you, when you, when you give it JSON data, it, 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 it promotes all of the keys that were in the JSON blob into variables just automatically. And then you can do conditional logic over it. So, for example... If um, you wanted something special to happen um, in, you know, like, let's say you wanted to um, give higher, higher priority in the logs for some reason to anybody who logged in, you can look at the, the, the method recorded, like, for example, login, that's the method mm-hmm. name. You can look at that and you can give it like, oh, yeah, double the priority of this event or flag this event as critical or, you know, you can do these conditional things with Logstash. But then you ask, well, now what? We've we've massaged the data, we've we've tinkered with it, we've promoted its, you know, importance, or we've tagged it differently. We've done stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, where do we put it now? How do we get users to be able to search this this data? Well, we put it into Elasticsearch. So Elasticsearch is um, based on Apache Lucene, which is sort of a sort of like Mongo, but it's not as good as Mongo. It's uh, it's a data store. It's just not as good as Mongo. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's old. It's um, 
you know, it works really well. It's really fast, but it's, um, it's not made for being relational at all. It, it, you know, it's, it's a no SQL kind of thing. Well, what's really cool about it is you can have all of this data just put into all of the, all of these table like structures called indices. Mm -hmm. And these indices can represent a lot of stuff. So the default behavior that Logstash and Elastic ship with is that Logstash will rotate the logs every day. So you'll have a okay. an index per day yeah. of user activity, yeah. and 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 that might be totally useful. You know, if you if you expect to be searching that way frequently, go for it. Yeah. Um, uh, our needs were a little bit different, so what we needed to do was have each index represent a kind of like a, a unique signature of action. So okay. what I ended up doing, and this is where it gets sort, sort of kind of bizarre, is um, the way that elastic represents data is you give it some data in, in into a new index it formats that index uh schema so like if you think of a, a regular mysql or postgres table yeah. you have a yeah. schema on a table it formats the schema in the index to be the types of whatever data you just gave it but then right. if you try to give it data again but it's different it'll say no you can't do that and reject the data hmm. so that's why we need to have a specific index for each action because Controller methods will have different arguments yeah. pretty much every single time. Yeah, definitely. So, and and we wouldn't need to do this if we weren't storing the arguments, so that's a whole other story. So then what we do is we take all of these indices, and one of the best parts of Elastic is, unlike a regular MySQL table or Postgres table, where you have to just sort of, you search one table at a time, and then you get rows back, what you can do in Elastic is you can search across indices. Even if the data is different, you can just do it. Okay. And it's so nice. cool. Yeah. Oh, so, totally. so for example, if you wanted to search for, uh, you know, any user that changed their password between today and a week ago who has a name that starts with the letter A, show me all the results, and it comes back just yeah. magically. And it's so amazing just to how flexible this thing is. Uh -huh. um, and then what's even better is you can do fuzzy searching. So let's say, you know, you have kind of like a template name. So like B, R, and then some letter, some letter, some letter, N. Yeah. Just anybody. I and mean, we might get Brian. We might get some other weird names like Brandon. <laughs> we yeah. don't know. Yeah. And And so it's extremely powerful, but it gets even better. So then let's say you didn't want just like a chronological search of data let's say you wanted to know um like, like the best fit like did this this user or some other user do something like this ever at least yeah so then you can promote individual fields in your indices especially even in this layer so not just taking it or not just changing it but it you can um so if you were searching for like uh, somebody sent a user a message you can have this message be weighted higher Okay. Right on. And, and it's just, it's so yeah. cool. That's fascinating, yeah. Um, And so this this feature, you know, we originally budgeted two weeks, but none of us knew Elastic, so we had to stretch it to three weeks. And it's just so amazing that this technology is so new and yet so undocumented and completely foreign to everybody. And yet somehow you can kind of cobble some pieces together and it just works. Yeah. That's awesome. Cool. Yeah. Well, that sounds that sounds pretty fun. Yeah, so really that's cool. the yeah. that's the power of not having to write any code. The code <laughs> we wrote in the last two weeks maybe measures out to 150 lines. Wow! It's the configuration configuration and, and changing the values in those 150 lines. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um, one of the weird things about Logstash is it doesn't. I think it's coded in Go. Okay. Which is super cool. Really? Yeah, because yeah. when you when you, when you get an error in Logstash, it says logger dot go failed. Blah 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 blah. Hmm. So I think it's written in Go, but the syntax for or maybe file beats written in Go. Some part of the stack is written in Go, but Logstash's configuration file format is in Ruby. <laughs> just, just, just to <laughs> okay. be different. Oh man, I wonder if somebody wrote like a Ruby configuration, like a yeah, a Ruby like a DSL, right? Yeah, right. right yeah, right. And the DSL just looks like Ruby. Uh, I, and I don't, I don't know what the deal is. So I, I think it's strange. Oh man. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So that's that's my um, fun time with 
user activity tracking. Yeah. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. Right on. Yeah. So cool that you get to work with Elasticsearch too. I've done some pretty preliminary stuff with it, but nothing, uh, nothing as massive as this. And it sounds like you've got a pretty neat solution there. Yeah. So, so that that's actually sort of the easy part, to be honest. So now uh-huh. I have to make a UI to make that searchable. Ah, gotcha. And, and so I get to make the API that communicates with Elastic to do that, but the UI for this is going to be what I like to say complicated. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we'll see how that goes. Gotcha. Yep. Well, I think we're just about onto that segment of the show where we start talking about the people we followed on Twitter since last we spoke. Yay! Yay. I actually follow right people on. on Twitter this time. Right. Wow. I, did, I actually did not follow any people <laughs> whatsoever. Um, I, I, I followed more accounts, but I did not follow any people. Wait a second. Uh, I feel like there's a loophole. There is, there is. Mm. So, uh, the, the first, uh, followee I'd like to call out is Africa by Toto bot. All it does is tweet sections of the song Africa by Toto. Uh, you might know the song from literally everything and everywhere. Uh, especially if you listen to oldies radio, um, it's it's really good. It's really useful. And sometimes when you're just having kind of a goofy day, it's nice to uh, get a little reminder uh, from Africa by Totobot that I don't know what I'm being reminded yet. Let's see. I have to look this up. Uh, that it's going to take a lot to drag me away from you <laughs> and stuff like that. So there you go. Yeah, uh, totally. th- th- that's my singing for the episode. I like I instrumental break. In <laughs> instrumental break. Yes, indeed. Cool. Uh, next up is Miami Butter, which is uh, a Twitter account for a long-haired dachshund that's super adorable. Um, Aww. Yeah. Like, look at it's look so at cute. Butter. It's like it's like a perfect name for it too, because it's like, oh, it's Butter. Look at Butter taking a nap. What a goofball. Uh, and then finally, uh, my last non-human uh, Twitter followee for this month is made by many, which is uh, kind of a, they call themselves a product innovation studio. Uh, sounds like uh, they kind of do similar work to what, what we do at Space. Mm, look at all um, those phones. I like that. Yeah, right? Mm-hmm. And they, they do so much like uh, interesting kind of product work. Uh, and one of the reasons why I actually really liked their, their page recently is because they've had some posts related to uh, testing React Native, uh, yeah. it, like QAing Re- React Native apps and stuff like that which is really neat. Um, and they just seem like really new people. I, I feel like they made something a little bit ago, too. I don't remember what it was called. They definitely, you know, same sort of model as many ad agencies have. Um, they have, like, product managers. They build things for clients. Um, but I think they might just be a little bit less ad-oriented than, than, uh, than like, a, an agency might be. Ah, oh, they, they made a really neat product a little bit ago. I don't remember what it was. Oh, are these the folks that did the... Um, uh oh my goodness what was it the um the phone jack thing for the iPhone 7 is that why i follow these people uh, i'm not sure <sighs> ah well well it th- doesn't matter <laughs> or does it matter no they made they made a game called pitch deck that's it uh and that's a that's a really uh interesting game essentially it uh matches like existing successful or um otherwise like prominent startups with uh, new subjects for them. So, like the card that it shows me is, it's like Tinder for pets. Um, but <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. So I'm actually on the list to get one of those uh, at some point, hopefully. Um, and I was just about to request it again, but I've already filled out this form a couple times. Um, so this is the reason why I think these folks are cool. How about you? Uh, what did you guys come up with for uh, followers of late? Well, um, I have been following well i followed first i'll say emojipedia so the the great index of emojis and documentation on it and how it looks on different platforms and applications and phones and whatnot um document different unicode versions and endpoints and yeah you could want to know about emojis they have it so i followed their twitter account i thought it'd be fun to introduce some emoji into my life they retweet some of the other accounts they have and people commenting so it's pretty pretty active account um, I should also note on this subject, I listened to the podcast Emoji Rap, which is from Emojipedia. So it's just a podcast on emoji. I don't think there are too many episodes, just a couple. I just, like, as we speak, just followed their Twitter account as well. Um, so I think there are, um, where are the, I don't know, I don't know how many pod- 
episodes they have, but they have a few good episodes on on it. Uh, I think the most recent one was uh, Craig Hockenberry from uh, Icon Factory. Oh, Talking right about on. Some of their time designing icons and things like that. So it's it's not just like you know meme culture around emojis, <laughs> but it's the design into it. So it's emoji in a podcast. I recommend. Nice. It. Uh, next, I followed Iplop. Um, I don't know her name. It's S Leaf Falling is the the name for her account. She is a developer of a new Twitter app called Leaf. I don't actually own this app, but I intend to buy it once I get an itunes gift card at some point and um i've i'm at the point where like it's almost holiday season so i'm just gonna instead of buying apps i'll just add it to a wish list and i'll just uh Mm -hmm. in mass buy all of them when i probably get an itunes gift card Uh, this is um, i don't think i'll leave tweetbot but i'm interested to see what it's like because there aren't too many twitter apps um these days yeah everybody's so scared to uh develop for it now yeah so the designer of this app is uh cernix who's a long time designer for many jailbreak utilities and things um, right on. but this is the developer of that app so good thoughts and retweets there and then last is osx sorry well yeah it's, it's what text. was that brian it's osx reverser so that's the oh. that's the um letters in the tw- twitter handle if i was gonna say it correctly it'd be os10 reverser um the oh, name of this is true. the mock monster um i followed this person for a while then unfollowed we'll see how long um just more more security thoughts on the Apple community. I follow quite a few security researchers, and this is one of them. And just I like to hear about the latest in um, how secure things are in that area. Nice. So that's me. What about you, Ryan? I, I like one of the, the, the guys' tweet. Uh, one password with touch ID. A really bad idea. Fingerprint shouldn't be used to unlock things. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah. So on my uh, on my phone, I have LastPass, of course, which you can unlock with fingerprint. But also, I have it set up so that you unlock it with fingerprint, but then you also have to enter the password. Okay. So it's double secure. I will say I use one password on my iPhone, and I have Touch ID because it's a lot faster. Yeah. For typing in my password. I understand. So you can set up one password to unlock with Touch ID. I didn't realize this. On the phone. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Do you have one oh, password pro? Yeah. Yeah. I think I don't even know if you need pro for that, but yeah, do it. I oh, think it's, my it's goodness. off by default, so that's probably why. But they, added, they added it quite a while ago, I think. But um, they're also working on one password for Mac to use Touch ID. Ah, I saw some design mockups on their Twitter account, and this is probably in response to that. That tweet. Yeah, enable it. It's so much, so much better. And oh my goodness, yeah. Um, they even will let you Touch ID when you first boot up the phone. So you mm-hmm. don't have to type in your password the first time your phone boots up hmm. like you do to log into your phone. Yeah, that's not secure enough for me. I think it's <sighs> secure enough for me because mm-hmm. my phone, if it's locked, is still behind a password or right. my fingerprint again. I guess. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. If someone's cutting off my finger, they must really want the information. So maybe I should they can have it. let them have right. it. It's free. I want my finger. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if there's anything about myself that makes – or any, any like information that any of my accounts have that is worth so much that somebody would want to – yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I do have my phone set to wipe data if there are 10 failed password That's or good. login attempts. So. Like all good iPhones. Yeah. Well, it's, it's off by default, but I turned it on. Mm-hmm. Well, I did follow some people this time. So we have Jim the Dev here. That's uh, a good, you you a good might name. know Jim the Dev from JavaScript Minnesota. He, I do he, indeed. He appears there frequently. Um, I did not incidentally meet him at JavaScript Minnesota. I met him at the uh, Open Source North, actually, when nice. we all went to Twitter to complain about how horrible a speaker was. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, and so I guess he followed me then, and uh, I followed him, and I just followed him recently, I guess. Apparently, I didn't click follow when he followed me before. Um, so Jim's really cool. He actually knows a lot of stuff. And so if you ask, you know, simple questions about things on Twitter, he'll answer, and it's really cool. Oh, nice. Yeah, he's an uh, instructor at the Iron Yard, isn't he? Yes. Yes, he is. Yeah, well, right. uh-huh. instructor former, it says. So, oh. no, current, current at the Iron Yard. Former at the somewhere, place. somewhere, somewhere else, yeah. So yeah, he's he's really good. And then right. let's see who's next here. Uh, Dan Abramov, whose name I cannot say. Abramov, maybe I don't know. Yeah, that um, guy. So, so he uh, co-authored Redux, and um, he made also the Create React app and the Hot Reloader for Webpack, of course. 
and um you know i've i've watched quite a few of his talks at um i don't know what conference it is but it's something to do with europe and um you know he's a really great guy and he he knows a lot about the, the tools he's made and he he's he's tried his hardest to simplify the the un, the, the the concept of what redux offers you know the the single store for state and then having the reducers and the middleware yeah. manipulate that state and then produce an action once an action comes in with the state. It's really cool. It's super fantastic. He's a really great guy to follow on Twitter too, because he tweets and, and for the most part stays on topic most of the time. <laughs> nice. Yep. And then we have Jord Walkie, also known as Jordan. Um, uh, he has something to do with JavaScript and Facebook and React, and I followed him. It's pretty cool. I don't really see many of his tweets because I don't think he tweets very often, just, you know, occasionally. And then finally, we have Wes Strait, who is a uh, project manager or project something or another. Basically, he's the director of operations at Doherty. Oh, right on. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he has a picture here of our recent, uh, what do you call it, business unit meeting. So that's pretty cool. Um, so when when we went to the U together for recruiting, he, he asks, hey, so uh, do you have Twitter? And I said, sure, of course. And so he's like, yeah, I've got to follow you now. And so I followed him back. Perfect. Yeah. So look, I'm using Twitter again. Yay! And now, <laughs> now it's uh, time for that time where we say, how many people do we follow? Oh well, yes. Total. Let's do that. Let's go with the highest person of 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 follow things. Oh my goodness! We know who that is, right? Ah, uh, is it Brian? Brian N- Mitchell. Good try. No, Brandon no. Mitchell. Brandon Mitchell. There yeah, we go. I think it is Brandon Mitchell. That is correct. Okay, so uh, I've got two thousand four hundred and forty-one people that I am following. <laughs> All right, I'm at. 287. Okay, well, I, I am in the <laughs> middle then the at 305. Oh my god, wow. there's an order of magnitude different there. I And I feel like I need to cut back a lot. I sometimes feel like there's too many and I, I can't catch up. If I'm if I'm like busy all day and mm-hmm. I come home at the in the evening and I like have something going on, I could have, you know, like 600 tweets to catch up from the whole day and that's... I'd... Oh my god, if I'm gone for an hour, I have 600 tweets to <laughs> catch up on. I love how he says that. Um, I don't know. I like to see uh-huh. everyone, and I follow people to see all their tweets. But there, and but the thing is, there's now some people who I feel like I should follow, but I don't. I'm not like too interested. Yes, uh-huh. I but understand. Who maybe followed me back, and it's like, what do I do? I don't know. Yeah, and um, that's. I'm getting to that point where it's just like, oh no. So what I think about this is that I follow, um, you know, stuff about you know code stuff, right? Yeah, and. When something happens in the spaces that I'm following, like I, I tend to follow people because they're in a space I'm interested in. So I followed a bunch of React people because I'm interested in the React space. Yeah. And, you know, I followed a bunch of Rust people a while ago when I was super interested in React. I mean, Rust, whatever. <laughs> Our words. Yeah. And when I follow people like this, when something in the space happens, they all sort of talk about it for a period of time so that I can see it, even if I skip some tweets. And, um, you know, like I follow you, I follow Brian, Brandon Mitchell. Who, Who are you, people? I don't um, know. You and Who Ian are starting to. <laughs> it's over for me. Sit here. And when you know, like the Apple event happens, like I'm covered no matter when I read my timeline. Yeah. So I, I try to follow spaces of people, and it works out really well. So that I can totally skip things if I want to. I don't always. I don't usually, but I can. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Now I'm going through my Twitter follows and unfollowing like random apps I don't use anymore. That's okay. But I feel bad because they don't ever tweet much, so it's not solving the issue. It's just lowering the number. No, I, I mean, I think I think that's one of those things. Like if, if an application wants to have an audience, they need to generate content to generate tweets about it. Yeah. It t- tis the brand covenant. Isn't it? <laughs> hey, I think the uh, RyanMR underscore bot account needs to tweet again. I think it needs uh, something to tweet about. As well as the at Brandon's watch account. Uh, well, my watch, my watch is perfectly content where it is. It doesn't need well, to. Well, maybe. I guess I can just say, still on Brandon's arm. Am I on Brandon's arm? Be, still on Brandon's arm. I would love all those tweets. <laughs> I wonder if there's like some way that I could hook into the active, the health API or something, and like. Oh, uh, Brandon's on the run. Right, like if I could build Brandon's an app. Stationary. If I could build an app that would somehow pull in health data, right? 
And if you just stand to... between the hours of like 1 a.m. and, and 6 a.m. on a weekday, yeah, it says, oh, Brandon's up late or Brandon's, Brandon's having a rough week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just say, buy Brandon coffee and no, no explanation. And, and so yeah. then, of course, if he does it right now and as the, as the closer we get to the middle of December, the, oh, the, the, the more bad things it'll say about him. <laughs> and then, you know, after December 31st, it'll just be blank because he'll have no, you know, he'll just be fine again. Yeah. yeah. So basically, make your bot be descriptions about your life. So you need to analyze your whole life based off this bot. Have, have fun. Really. And and you know what? You can have all the data be aggregated with Elastic. Yeah, there you go. Nice. You can whip that up tonight. Yeah, totally. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> after 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 I grade some papers, I'll be yeah. Very shape. good. <laughs> all right. Well, this has been lots of fun. I mean, Tons of fun. you know, we should do this at least every month. At least once a month. <laughs> Remember when you did it weekly? Yeah, I don't know how that was even possible. That was remarkable. It was summer, so none of us were that busy with... I was probably that busy. I don't know. Well, you were in school still. No, or were you done? No, yeah. you were in school still. When? This summer? No, last summer. Oh, yeah, last summer. Yeah. 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 And so we were all we all were. Yeah, that was that was easier. Though we did it, like, weeknights remotely. Like, like you know, my dream for the future is, like, when, when the tech becomes available that we can all be individual tracks but only recorded in line, like nobody has to do the work recording locally, yeah. I, d- uh-huh. I can just be at work and just record. Alternatively, when I have my MacBook Pro at work, from work, I will also be able to do whatever I need to do. And it'll just be, <laughs> yeah. just be fine. Yeah, I, I would be all for recording multi-track. Like I was thinking of buying another mic and just getting a little boom and just putting it at work. <laughs> <laughs> I've... I've... I should really buy a mic for home, but I've been coming to the studio a lot more. Yeah, so. you know, you're pretty close right now, so yeah. it's not but, too bad. You know, if when I move later, yeah. mm-hmm. it will be a yeah. lot less convenient, so I probably right. won't be over as much. But no. mm-hmm. hopefully, you get some good fiber wherever you move to. That is like requirement number two. Number one being, I like the place. So I like how <laughs> that's number one, and that's number two. That's good. No. I do have some sane priorities in my life. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. At least when, one. When, <laughs> when we At heard this one. place had you. When the, when we heard this place had USI, we were like, yeah, no, nope, yep, don't is, care. Doesn't matter if the hot place is falling apart. Every other gosh darn house on the block has um, uh, is like has to pick between Comcast or CenturyLink. Oh. But no, our building has USI, and it nice. is all. Awesome. <laughs> oh, that's yeah, good. It's the way to do what, it. What speed do you have? Did you say 100 megabit? I think 100 megabit. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah. one of my coworkers at work, um, also one of uh, the people we've talked about here on Twitter. Um, Dr. God Carl, um, he recently switched presumably to U.S. Internet Fiber, and um, he's Symmetric 500. Wow. Yeah. That is fantastic. Oh, man. That's amazing. And so How he, much does all that cost? I don't... I, I think he said it's it's $80 a month. Oh, that's so good. That's such a good deal. <laughs> like, you, right. have a, you have one roommate. That's nothing, then. Yeah. He... I mean, you know, he wow. lives with his fiance, and they both have jobs, so that's no problem. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, wow. Yeah, it's um. I would and, love and that. He, and he he said like um, uh, you know, he we we were doing some deploys to the staging server a few weeks ago, and like, yeah, you know, I could upload it here in the office, or I could go home, and it would be done in like three minutes. Right, right. For yeah. all nine services to be deployed. Hmm. Yeah. That was an easy choice. Yeah, I I have a higher speed of internet here than I do at my office, but only slightly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and- like the th- the thing that just kills me, right? Is we were, uh, last time we recorded remotely, I believe we were having a bunch of that was pre uh, when we upgraded our wireless router. Yes, and perhaps more importantly, when I upgraded my wireless card in my computer. Hey. Uh, so now that I have eight hundred two dot eleven AC, mm-hmm. um, I uh, can go through like three walls <laughs> uh, full of pipes, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so is the the AC a lot better? For I I feel yeah you. I mean we're or it's the card I, I has can, better antennas that, or something maybe. That, that's really interesting yeah. because I I was under the impression that AC was constrained to five gigahertz bands in general which which is generally a lower yeah yeah uh, penetration rate uh, so how did that work I think it's just because the the, the two point four gigahertz band is just so crowded here. yeah so crowded well um, I, I will I will mention how many like HP direct printer networks do you have twenty <laughs> gosh I hate nah. those things. Nah, we we don't have. Uh, oh, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, let's see. A handful of Netgears. 
Yeah, just the two. Oh, nope, there's a third one. Okay. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, I was reading some little article post. Wow. Little, little article or post or tweet or something the other day. Probably, I think it was yesterday even. Um, just talking about how oversaturated things are. You know, someone lived in an apartment building that came with a supplied wireless network for every room yep. or for every apartment yep. plus like a wireless yeah. printer or I something. Can't, like, I can't even supplied. imagine. So it meant, They're all interfering with each other. Yeah. So it meant, and they were all at both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. So it was just so oh, much overcrowding yeah. and they didn't even supply a wired thing. No, nope, of course not. It was requiring not. everyone to be wireless. It's just like... Yeah. Ugh. Yeah, so... Hopefully, wherever I live, I'm a little worried about living in an apartment building just due to reliability. But well, we'll see. Yeah. But well, depend depending on your uh, price range, I can I can share with you uh, a couple of places that um, are really neat and kind of um, tend to be pretty, like, uh, shall we say, not built like the apartment buildings near the U. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> good stuff. <laughs> well, if if I if this all works out and I work in Eden Prairie, I'll want to live in this in far... Eden Prairie yeah no I don't want to live in Eden Prairie oh okay. I want to live I would like to live in as far south in Minneapolis as I can that has USI internet right right yeah that makes sense ooh well that's interesting then because I want I want to live in the cities I like the St. Paul Minneapolis right on so you know maybe I would settle for an, a northern part of a southern suburb but I don't want to live in Eden Prairie or any of those outer ring ones yep right Oh, there was there was a new building that just went up in uh, kind of in uptown, not really in uptown, kind of more in Kingfield. Well, well, we'll take this offline. I'll show you. We can we can end the episode and then I'll share that info with you then. <laughs> that sounds like a good plan. Yes. So this is a right on good good old podcast again. It's yeah. Like bonus end material. We're gonna have to do this again sometime. Yes. We will indeed. Sounds good. Well, have a good one. Have a good one. <laughs>